All right, welcome everybody. This is the definitive deep dive into the .git folder. Um, here's the part where I tell you about all the slides and I have exactly zero slides. So here is the one and only slide. <laughs> this is notepad. The definitive deep dive into the Git folder. All of this will be live and that will be really great. So um, if you wanna go grab the code that we're gonna look at today, github.com slash robrich slash git explorer, you can get to that from robrich.org. Click on presentations here at the top and here's the link to that GitHub repo, of what we'll dig into today. While you're here on robrich.org, you can click on about me and get to this screen that'll talk about some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is wonderful. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We begin coding Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software off to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp, or if you'd like a Give Camp in your area, hit me up on Twitter or send me an email, and let's get philanthropy installed in your area too. Some of the other things that I've done, uh, secret source control basics, mine is chapter eight. <laughs> I worked on Git in version two and version three as a core contributor, and I do training with um, gitgrit.com. One of the things I'm particularly proud of is um, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! <laughs> so that's my claim to fame. So let's dig in. Here is a folder. That's not the folder. Here is a folder. And this folder is completely empty. That's the folder that we'll be working in today. So here's that folder no content in it, let's create a Git repository, Git init. Now what this did is this created this .git folder right here. Now this .git folder, I have visible because I've gone into view, uh, options, and I've chosen to hide or to show um, hidden files and folders. If you check that box, then you're able to see it as well. Or um, depending on your operating system, that box might be in a different spot, but there's that .git folder, and that is the Git repository. Now today we're gonna go through all of the files here in this .git folder. Now we're not gonna go through all of the Git commands, but we will hit all of the files in the Git folder. Let's create some Git uh, history. Echo file one to file one.txt, git add file one, git commit dash m, file one. Woohoo! We've just created some git history. Git log dash dash one, one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. There's our, our git history. Let's do that again. Echo file two into file two dot txt, git add file two, git commit dash m, file two. Okay, so now we've got some history. Git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. And we see that head is pointing to master. Let's fix that real fast. Git checkout dash b main, git branch dash d master. That looks better. Awesome. So now let's go wander through this .git folder. I'm gonna open this .git folder up in VS Code. Now the cool thing with VS Code is it'll actually hide the Git folder for you and not show it in this list of contents. So I'll actually open the Git folder specifically. Let's pop open the objects folder. Here in the objects folder, we see a bunch of folders. And those folders look kind of familiar. E114F11, E1, ooh, 14F11. Now this is <laughs> a bunch of garbage. <laughs> this is a VLID compressed or deflate uh, embedded uh, file. So if we wanted to, we could do lots of things to try and uh, uncompress this. It's the deflate algorithm. We can go to GunZip or we can do some Python content or there's an open SSL command that'll get us there. 
In this case, I'm going to open up this, um, I created this node program that will just quickly unzip it. So we're using the Zlib library and we will just inflate this file and then dump it straight out to the console. So let's do that. Unzipper.git slash E1 slash uh, object slash E1 slash. Okay, so that's the content there in this file. Now it's a commit node. It's 226 bytes. That's what all of this content is. Here's our commit message. Here's a tree that references another git hash. That's kind of interesting. The parent node, the node right above us. So there's that 867. Some author details, date time for the commit, and date time for the push. Let's look at this node. Now that one, two, there's that one, two, and there's that commit right there, or rather that tree node. So unzipper.git objects. Nope, not that one. Unzipper.git objects. Uh, one, two, and we can see this tree node. Now it's got some uh, unusual characters. We can use a git command for that. Git cat, cat file dash t, and we can go after that git hash. Now we only need something that's unique. So, you know, those first few things. So it is a tree node. That's cool. Git cat file dash p. Here's the contents of that file. So it's listing out those two blob nodes. Ooh, a blob node. We've looked at commit nodes, we've looked at tree nodes, and now blob nodes. Let's go look at this blob node, git cat file dash t. Obviously it's a blob. <laughs> git cat file dash p, and here's the content. Uh, that is nine bytes, so seven bytes, the carriage return, and a null at the end. Nine bytes. We can see unzipper, unzipper dot git objects nine four. Here it is, it's nine bytes in that file. So we do have a bunch more uh, folders here in this objects folder than we just looked through. Here's one commit, well, two commits, two tree nodes, two blobs, and therefore we have six files in our repository right now. Wouldn't it be cool if we could um, browse through all of them together? So I built this open source project here at uh, github.com slash robrich slash git dash explorer that allows us to do just that. Here in git explorer, we give it the path to the config file or in a dot end file, we specify the path to our git repo. And so I specified it here in this um, git folder. And now if I pull up localhost 3000, we'll see this git explorer. So here's all of our nodes, 86, E1, 1, 2, 9, 4. 9, 4 was interesting. Here's that blob, 2, 6. Well, it might be nice to, I don't know, let's make them alphabetical and show the tag. Now we can kind of see that. Okay, so here's E1, that's our main head. And so we can look at that. Yep, that's a commit node. And here's the parent node, 867. So if we go look at this one, that's gonna be a commit node too. It references this tree, B97, there's that tree. Well, let's kind of show it in a parent-child relationship and show that type. Here's commit nodes, here's tree nodes, here's blob nodes. We'll draw some lines between it. And this is quite different than the git history that we we're looking at before. Typically with the git history, we only see these two commit nodes. Now we can look at all of the other nodes within it too. Isn't it interesting that this tree node references this file and file two? That's kind of cool. So, now let's do some interesting things. Echo file three into file three.txt, git add file three. Now I've added it, but I've not committed it. 
So here in our Git objects folder, we see we now have seven nodes, seven DAG nodes. That's interesting. Well, what is that seventh DAG node? Let's show the type. We'll put it in parent-child relationship. We'll show the lines and the tags. Here it is. So we already have a blob node in our repository, even though we haven't committed it. We've only staged it. That's cool. So now if we were to say echo file four into file four.txt, git add file four, git status, now we see that there are two files staged. We have two blobs in our repository. But no tree nodes pointing to them, no commit nodes. If we were to do a git gc right now, those things would be gone. Well, let's commit those. git commit dash m file three and four. Now we have all of that content in place. Let's show the type, parent child, show the lines, show the tags. Here's that new commit. That goes to this folder. And here's those two um, new blobs. Well, what if I create a new folder in here? Let's create a new folder, new folder. We'll call it folder. And now let's echo some content into it. Echo file one into folder slash file one dot txt. Git add dot git status. Okay, so we have one file staged. Git commit dash m folder slash file one. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Show the type, parent child, show the lines, show the tags. Here's that new commit. And it has a tree node that references this tree node because file one is in it. In addition to that, it references file one directly because file one is in that same folder. So here it's referencing the original folder from this tree node from the original commit, and it's referencing the original file. It doesn't need to duplicate the file in the repository. It's already there. It's exactly the same. That's pretty cool. Let's amend a commit. So let's pop open, I don't know, file four, um, and let's change file four. git add dot git status. So we only got file four. git commit dash dash amend dash m uh, folder one and file four. So now we've amended this commit. If we say git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. Oops. Graph. Ooh, haha. <laughs> Typing is hard. Git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. There we go. So now we only see these four commits because we amended this one. But if we refresh our repository, show type, parent child, show the lines, show the tags, we still have this fifth commit. We just have no branches pointing at it. So as soon as we do a garbage collect inside Git, this commit will go away. But if I accidentally committed my credentials here in this blob, it's still in my repository. If I push this to a remote, it would still be in the remote, in spite of the fact that I came back and changed it later to point out a different file for. Here's that different file for. So as soon as you commit the content into the repository, consider that secret lost. OK, we did a whole lot in the objects folder. And we saw how we had blobs and tree nodes and commits. Let's look in the refs folder. Well, we have in heads this thing called main. That kind of matches our main branch, 071a. We've seen that commit before. There's 071a. There's also a thing out here called head. And head right now points at rest heads main. That's where our checkout directory is. 
So arguably, I wish head was inside the rest folder because it is a rest, <laughs> but it's not. So now if we did something like this, get check out this one. Now we get into this really interesting thing, this detached head state. So if I were to take my head off, <laughs> we're in a detached head state. Uh, I feel like I'm in some zombie movie or something. What detached head state means is that if we pop open this head file again, it's pointing at a commit. It's not pointing at a branch. So if we were to do something like this, echo file 6 to file 6.txt, git add file 6, git commit dash m file 6, Git log, let me go grab that. There it is. Now we have head pointing at this thing. And if we were to check out, I don't know, git checkout main, now it's gone. Well, is it gone? Let's go pull up the viewer, show type, Parent child, show the lines, show the tags. Well, it's still there. We just don't have anything pointing at it yet. That's what it means by detached head. So git checkout, uh, where was it? Git checkout 7.5. Git checkout that. Git checkout dash uh, git checkout or git branch new feature git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all <laughs> we're back well kind of if we pop open head we see it's still pointing at this other commit so we've created the branch now we need to check out the branch git checkout new feature git git log and we see that now head is pointing at this new feature. We are no longer in a detached head state. That was cool. Git tag 1.0, git log. We can see now we have a tag at this spot. Popping up in the refs folder, we can see that we have a tags folder. And here's that 1.0. Now, does 1.0 point at master or new branch? No, it points directly at that commit. The presumption is that tags won't move, so they point directly at commit. Is head pointing at the tag? Nope, head's still pointing at my branch, and my branch is still pointing at that commit. The tag is another pointer to that commit. That's perfect. So let's talk about another server. Let's build up a server here on this machine. We're going to create a new folder. We'll call this server. Now, a Git repository is both a client and a server if we want it to be. So here in this you know, server, <laughs> git init dash dash bear. Now, what bear says is that we don't have a dot git folder. We only have the content that would be in that dot git folder. That's pretty cool. So now back in our regular repository, git remote add origin. Here's where we would say HTTPS some server. But instead of that, I'm going to say dot dot slash server. My server is a folder on my file system. Git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. And we don't have any content here yet pointing at our remote. Git push origin main. OK, we've just pushed the main branch off to the server. Git push origin new feature. We've pushed that. Uh, graph uh, that branch off. So now we have origin slash new feature and origin slash main. Popping open our REST folder, we now have a new folder called remotes. Inside remotes, we have an origin folder. And inside origin, we have main and new feature. So here's the git hash that our server believes that's on. And so this tracking branch allows us to keep track of what we've sent to the server recently. Now, if we were to create more content, git uh, echo file 8 to 
file 8.txt, git add file 8, git commit dash m file 8. Now we can see that the spot where we believe the server to be is different than the spot where our branch is. Here's the one in refs heads, and here's the one in remotes. So now we can do something like git merge main. Looking at that history, we now see that new feature has the content from the regular stuff and the content from main. And of course, now I'm going to do something silly like git checkout main. And we look through our history, git checkout main. Oh, yeah. Then, so I finished my feature, git checkout main, git branch dash D because, you know, capital D because I'm feeling brave. New feature, git log. Ugh. Did I just lose all my work? So we looked at refs. Let's look at logs. So here in logs, we have a refs heads main. Here's the history of where the main branch has been. It started out at nothing, and then it moved to this commit. It started from that commit, and it moved to this commit. And so we can kind of walk through the history. So master, or main is now right here. Here's um, head's history. So we see that at the end, head was right here. That's when we checked out uh, main. Here's the commit right before that. So that's probably where we want to go. There's another way that we can browse this log, git ref log, and that will show the history of where we went. So we want to go back to here, git checkout there, git checkout dash b new feature, and go back to our log. <sighs> We're back. Reflog can be really, really helpful in getting back to where we were by understanding how we navigated through all the things. So that's logs. Hooks. Hooks is really interesting. Here in hooks, we see we've got a shell script. We've got some more shell scripts. We've got, um, this one is a Perl script. <laughs> Now, all of these end in dot sample. So I'm going to go grab some content out of, uh, that's not it. I'm going to go grab some hooks. And these just have the um, dash sample removed from them. Now, each one just says echo the content that we got the command line parameters passed into the script, together with an arrow that says, here's the spot that we are on. So now we've got an apply patch, a git commit patch, a post update patch, a pre commit patch, <laughs> git log. So now let's add some new content, echo file 7 to file7.txt, git add file 7, git commit dash m file 7, git log. Now, in that process, we saw some interesting things. As we added the thing, we didn't get any pre-commit hooks. But here, as we committed it, we got a pre-commit hook. We got a prepare commit message hook. We got a commit message hook. As we push, git push origin new feature, we're also going to get a pre-push hook. Now, here's where we could do really interesting things. We could, I don't know, lint the code, run unit tests, validate that our commit messages are in the correct format, maybe mutate the messages to match our expected format. There's lots of automation that we can do here in this, uh, in these commit hooks. And so let your imagination go and do some really interesting things. But eh, now I want to commit these. I've created some really interesting git hooks. Git add dot git slash hooks 
slash pre apply patch get status. I can't actually add these to my repository, and I really want to be able to share these so that others can work with these as well. That's why there's packages like this. Git hooks, if you're in the NPM world, there are other packages in other ecosystems. As I add this package to my system, it will actually create scripts that are in my repository so that I can then sh shim them from the hooks folder into files that I can version. As you're looking for hooks, grab a package like this so that you can version your hooks and everyone can use them. Sometimes we need to do some initialization things to be able to create those sim links or those wrappers. And that's what Git hooks does really well. As you install Git hooks, it will actually create those sim links for you. So we looked at hooks. We looked at logs, objects, refs, Info, this is interesting. This looks a lot like an exclude file. Now, typically, we'll create a .git ignore file to exclude things. And we definitely could do that here instead of there. If you wanted to have one that was specific to your local machine that wasn't shared with the rest of your team, you could do it here. I would recommend just using a regular .git ignore file, though. But that exclude is interesting. While we're here looking at configuration, though, Let's look at the config file. So here's a config file, and this kind of specifies the configuration details. In this case, ignore case is true, bare is false. We talked about bare. On the server, that's where it doesn't have the .git folder. Now, this is the override specific to the files that I have in my folder. So I'm going to go look at the .git config file in my user profile. And here I have the name and email that I set when I first created my repository. Here's my GitHub account. I have my merge and diff tools set, some aliases. And so all of these will take effect. But if I wanted local overrides, I could, for example, I, was, I set up my machine for hobby projects, but this is a work project. So I want this to be at work.co. And my GitHub user account is um, Acme Inc. Now all of the commits that I do will not be specific to my personal account. They'll be specific to my work account. These configs override the config in my user home directory. Here's a description file. And there was a question about, um, am I going to talk about InstaWeb? <laughs> this is the description about InstaWeb. We don't usually use InstaWeb anymore. We use, I don't know, GitLab or GitHub. But if you use InstaWeb, Here's the description that will show up in Git InstaWeb. We talked about head. This is interesting, an index file. Let's open it anyway. It's a binary file. Uh, that looks kind of ugly. This index file is actually, um, oh. Yes, this index keeps track of all of the files in the repository, and or all of the files in the working directory. If I wanted to, I could go parse this file by hand and do all of the mayhem. Uh, this uh, repository, Jin, is a really cool Python program that is able to parse that index file. But I could also use git ls files dash dash stage. And that actually will list out all of the files in that index. So what we see here in this index is that it has the blob hash. So we can verify that, git cat file dash t, the type for that thing, git cat file dash p, the contents of it. And there's that content. of It's listing out all of the blobs in our repository so that it can very quickly do diffs and merges and index and status, all of the things that it needs to do really fast, it can do straight away from this um, index file. This zero is kind of interesting. Zero means that there is no merge conflict. As we get into merging, it'll use one, two, and three to reference mine and yours and our base. But because we're not in a merge scenario, all of ours are at zero right now. Um, <laughs> then it'll use stage two and stage three for the other differences. And yeah, this index is, is 
kind of nuts. <laughs> some other stuff in here. There's some other logs. We talked about the ref logs. Here's a commit edit message. Now, this is the last commit message that I did. And we will use this file to be able to pass back and forth to my pre-commit hook and the other hooks. Um, a ridge head, where the head was right before it did the current head so that it can pass it between those scripts. So we looked at all of the files here. A ridge head is a cache file. Commit edit message is a cache file. Description is that message for InstaWeb. Head is a rest. <laughs> Index is so that it can do really fast uh, things in our working directory. The config, which overrides the thing in our user home directory. Rests, which keep track of branches and tags. Objects, which store commits or um, trees or blobs, depending on the type of content. And as we stage things, we'll get blobs. As we commit things, then we'll get the trees and the commits. Our logs that allow us to do ref log to be able to recover things. Info that <laughs> has a really poor way of doing git exclude files and the hooks that allow us to do really interesting automation. All of these pieces under the hood make up this .git folder database. What's really cool as we dig into this .git folder, we can see kind of the inner workings of how git works. Sometimes we like to fight Git or you know, just kind of throw up our hands and go, I don't know what it's doing, but I have the things uh, strapped to my uh, post-it note strapped to the side of my keyboard. I hope this tour through the .git folder has given you a little bit more understanding of some of the decisions that have been made as we do this. This Git Ready blog post is actually really cool because it describes each of those things. Here's each of the files, and here's all the things that you can do with them all the purposes for each of the files. I'm Rob Richardson. This was a lot of fun digging through the .git folder. If you have questions that you find tomorrow, hit me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich, or send me an email by clicking on contact me from robrich.org. With that, what are your questions? Can I send the repo link here? Yes, let me grab this repo link and paste it here in the answer. Can I paste it here in the answer? There's the answer. Awesome. We talked about InstaWeb. That was really cool. Is the only data about a merge in the index? Um, that's a good question. Some of the details about the merge end up in the index. Some of the details about the merge come in the form of the commits that we're trying to stitch together. So generally, when we get into a merge scenario, we have two different commits going in different places. We saw that we were able to visualize, you know, we began this process and we went here. So we'll have different commit nodes in our objects directory. We'll also have different tree nodes and file nodes referencing the merge. But ultimately, as we're in the middle of the merge, yeah, <laughs> other than you know, temp files, all of the details are there in the index. As we get into a merge, we may end up with .orig files. And um, we saw that when we were looking at the config, uh, not this config, uh, uh, open recent. Dot git config. I've rigged up um, beyond compare to look at my files. So it'll pull in the local file, the remote file, and uh, the base file and the merge file. It'll pull in those four file names. And so you'll end up with those temp files in interesting places. So yeah, technically, those files exist as you're merging a specific file. That was a great question. Thanks. What is the purpose of the commit versus tree files? I didn't quite understand why they were unique. Good question. Let's dig into that. So here's the commit node. And the commit node's purpose is to give me the name, the date, the parent node. It's the one that we uh, look at more visibly. That's the particulars that we're going to attach to as we do most of the thing. Now, the commit node references a tree node. The tree node starts to reference 
file system details. Here's all of the files associated with this commit. Now, in the commit note itself, it didn't say anything about that. It didn't say which files were in it. At most, it you know had the commit message. But here inside the tree node, that's when we start to enumerate the changes associated with this commit. Here are the files that we have. Now, what's cool is it's referencing all of the files, whether they changed or not. That's the tree node. Now, we notice in this case, the tree node references another tree node. So if you have lots of files and folders, you'll have lots of nested tree nodes. So this tree node goes to B9. Here's B9 right here. And that tree node references a particular blob. So tree nodes reference uh, other tree nodes and also reference blob nodes. The blob nodes, that's where the actual data is stored. As we um, change our files, we'll get the new blob data in our repository. Now, that blob is what actually stores the data. And because it's storing the data, then if two different paths reference the same file, we don't need another copy of the blob making our repository bigger. Instead, we just reference the same blob. That's why we have the separation between blobs and trees, so that we can have files that may move. And at that point, I'm changing the tree node, but I'm not changing the big blob node in our repository. That was a good question. What are some other popular tools similar to Git Explorer? In this case, I built this because I couldn't find one. <laughs> Most Git viewers won't look at all of the different kinds of uh, nodes. They'll just cruise through commits. And if all you really want to know is, you know, what are the commits? What can I check out? Then a tool that just does commits could be perfect. I really wanted to look into all of the things. I wanted to know which um, refs pointed at the uh, pointed at each commit. I wanted to know the trees and how they pointed to each blob. And so I actually wrote Git uh, Explorer. I'd love to have some help on this. Uh, I've started a live stream where I'm refactoring this <laughs> because somebody wrote some really awful code in here. But uh, if you'd love to help with Git Explorer, I would love your help with that. A little off topic. Do you know why Git LFS always falls back to HTTP, HTTPS, even if the remote is SSH? That is a good question. And ultimately, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Git LFS falling back to HTTP if the remote is um, SSH. That is interesting. My guess is that Git LFS is a different um, URL than the remote. Like maybe what you've committed is the path to that file in the file share rather than the actual content. I believe that's what Git LFS is about. What was that blog URL again? Good question. Go to robrich.org and click on presentation. Here's that URL right there, robrich.org. Let me see if I can paste that in this answer. Yes. Ooh. I wonder what that private button does. How are rebases reflected in this? Good question. So what happens when we rebase? Git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. So let's rebase these two commits over the top of main. First, let's check this out and make it a new branch. Git check out this, git check out dash b, Pre-rebase, git log, one line graph. OK, so now we have this content. And let's ignore these for now. Git rebase main. So we hit some hooks, pre-rebase hook, prepare commit hook, prepare commit message. And each of those were past this commit edit message file in case they wanted to mutate that message. Ultimately, we finished git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all. And we now see that those commits got transplanted over the top of that. So how is this, uh, how does this work inside that uh, repository? Show type, parent child, show the lines, show the tags. Here's those two commits. 
The commits are different, but this commit references this tree, which is also referenced by this commit. The tree didn't change, so we didn't need another commit, another tree node in our git object. Similar thing, here's this commit, and it references this tree node. Oh, it looks like this tree node did change a little bit. So how is the rebase reflected in our repository? We'll move our uh, heads, depending on how we rebase, and we'll rewrite our commits. But depending on what we change underneath, we probably won't change our trees or our blobs in our Git repository to pull off that rebase. Ultimately, depending on the nature of what you uh, change during your rebase, like if you squash or if you edit commits or you know do things like that, you may end up affecting other nodes in that process as well. That was a great question. You had alluded to a blob being permanent. Are they not GC'd as well if they only reference by a commit that isn't on any branches? Good question. So uh, in this case, we have this commit right here that is referenced by nothing. So this happens in the normal course of the, uh, the Git history. Periodically, if nodes are older than two weeks or more than a certain number of things change, internally, it'll call Git GC. Git GC will go find all the things and do a garbage collection. In the process of doing that garbage collection, now if we go look through these objects, hey, wait a minute, did we just delete the everything? <laughs> we didn't. They're baked into these pack files. Now, one is a pack file.idx. It's the same format as this um, index file right here, but it also references many commits. And here's that pack file. That's all of those commits pushed into one. Now that makes it smaller. It's only 3K instead of you know many K, <laughs> but we still have all of the commits in our history. Ooh, do we not? Yeah, we do. Show type, parent child, lines, tags, except for that one that was dangly. Oh, <laughs> here's that one that was dangly. It didn't get cleaned up yet. In time, it probably would get cleaned up, and I'm actually surprised it didn't. Maybe it noticed that it hadn't been two weeks yet. So are you going to wait for your secrets to uh, wait for two weeks to see if your secrets got exposed? Uh, they do get garbage collected eventually. So you're right. Thanks for calling me on that. But as soon as you leak your secrets into a Git repository, you should probably consider them exposed in spite of the fact that you might be able to GC and get rid of that commit node. Nah, it's generally not worth the risk. It's easier just to um, roll your secret. Thanks for that question. Hi, what is happening during a shallow clone using the dash dash depth command? That is a good question. So what happens when I do a git clone at a certain depth? It's only going to go back so many commits. So let's say I grab this one and I said, get me a depth of three. One, two, three. It just won't grab all of these other nodes. And in, in fact, it will rewrite this last one. Right now, it says the parent is this commit. As I'm doing a shallow clone to make the Git repository work well, it'll actually say that there is no parent. If we were to go, oh, I can't scroll. <laughs> if we were to go all the way down to the bottom, we would see that that first node doesn't have a parent node. So when we shallow clone, that's exactly what it does. It just rewrites the last commit to say that it has no parent. Everything else is the same. Great question. How will emerging weaknesses of SHA-1 affect Git? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. These are SHA-1s. Now, they're not used for cryptography. They're just used for um, validation. But it's possible as SHA-1 starts to deteriorate further that we may choose to move away from SHA-1 and hash these differently. Now, that's a decently traumatic move for Git because all of the Git repositories everywhere use SHA-1 right now. So if I Git clone the repository and I'm trying to look through history, but I can't use SHA-1 anymore, there's going to be a process of probably upgrading each repository or a time when um, repositories can use either SHA-1 or a newer SHA mechanism to be able to do that. 
It'll be interesting to see what they choose as they flip from SHA-1 to something else. In the shortest term, the reason that we haven't moved on from SHA-1 yet is very specifically, these, these uh, hashes are not used for cryptography. They're not used for security. They're only used for hashing. And is that the right choice? I think we can make good arguments on both sides of that. That was a great question. So how will this be shown into Viscosi? I'm not familiar with Viscosi. I'd love to learn more. Send me a tweet or send me an email, and let's dig into that one some more. Git GC dash dash aggressive. Ooh, good call. Let me do that. Git GC dash dash ag aggressive. Spelling is hard. <laughs> OK, now will that commit be gone? Show type, parent child, show the lines, show the tag. Hmm. I fear that I have something pointing at this that makes it not want to uh, garbage collect yet. I think that might be all the questions. This was, oh, can we view the kernel in Git Explorer? True stress test will be a crazy graph. Yeah, how would we uh, show Git Explorer in Git Explorer? <laughs> that would be really cool. Here is uh, Git Explorer, the source for it. So let's grab this folder. And in the uh, env file, we'll pop that open and point it at there. I do need to escape it because you know Windows has the slashes going the wrong way. Let's stop this repository, start it back up. Yeah, this will be fun. There we go. Show the type, parent child, lines, tags. What this highlights is that I need a way to scroll. <laughs> but yeah, here's the um, hashes. Uh, somebody needs to fix something. I think uh, that somebody who wrote something needs to fix something. Here's some tags or some tree nodes. That was really cool. I'm glad we got to explore Git Explorer with Git Explorer. Isn't the SHA code of a commit based also on the parent? So overriding the parent in shallow clone would have to rewrite all following commits, no? I think you're right. I want to explore now doing a shallow clone and uh, diffing it with a non-shallow clone and see what's actually different. I think I might have been mistaken. How do you see initiatives from Microsoft to modify Git to host its huge code base as compared to repo? <laughs> um, political issues aside, <laughs> uh, Microsoft bought GitHub, not Git. And I'm not sure that they know that. And I think I will leave it there. That was fun. We've definitely gone over time, but this was a lot of fun getting to show you um, the definitive deep dive into Git. Find me on Twitter for those questions that we haven't asked here. and. Um, uh, and see, I'll see you on Slack. Thanks for joining us.